don't be shy, have a seat. <laughs> I want to welcome you all to this event. This is a really unique event. Uh, my name is Evelyn Farkas. I am the, the, the person who has the pleasure of organizing this event. I'm the executive director of the McCain Institute. I actually did not organize it myself, so I really have to give a huge round of thanks to my colleagues and of course to Senator Risch, who has, has very kindly agreed to host us here, along with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And we are truly uh, grateful to also have the, the Ukrainian Ambassador, Oksana Makarova, with us here today. We have Senator Ben Cardin, Senator Jim Risch, as I mentioned, our, 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 our host. And um, what we're going to do today, in partnership with the World Central Food Kitchen, and we have the CEO of the World Central Food Kitchen here joining us today as well, is to talk about the untold and sometimes overlooked stories of hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians who, as citizens, have answered a call to defend their home country and the sanctity of democracy, not through the military, Although, of course, many of you might remember in 2014, 2015, already Ukrainian citizens were helping the military and joining the military, providing hot food at the, at, the, at the front. But today, they're doing it through grassroots efforts across the entire Ukrainian community. Indeed, not only in Ukraine, but outside of Ukraine, and you'll hear about that today. The work of these citizens should be an inspiration to all of us, Americans and truly everyone, as they not only fight for their country, but they fight for democracy for the surrounding region and really for the international community. We, we applaud these efforts, some of which we're going to highlight today during our panel discussion. They have focused on ordinary citizens stepping up to provide humanitarian aid, stabilize political and civil society institutions throughout the crisis to document human rights abuses, which we know there are many of, and ensure the country remains defiant in the face of Vladimir Putin. This comes, of course, in the backdrop of a global food crisis caused by Vladimir Putin, Somalia, Kenya, Ethiopia, Senegal, Cameroon, and other African countries, as well as Egypt and North Africa, are experiencing extreme food crisis because of the war that Vladimir Putin chose to wage against Ukraine. And indeed, the international community needs to act on this undeterred by Russia and its threats. But in the meantime, the grassroots response continues, and that's what we're highlighting today. It's a vital component of the Ukrainian effort to protect their sovereignty, and it is of utmost importance that we as a global society recognize this effort and support it. And that's what we intend to do today. Over the last decade, the McCain Institute, through our McCain Global Leaders Program and other leadership programs, has proudly supported Ukrainians and those in surrounding countries before and during the invasion. In our 2022 cohort, we are lucky to have two Ukrainians who have, of course, embodied Senator McCain's call to serving causes greater than oneself. And we will hear from one of them, Maria Levchenko, today on the panel after we have heard from our distinguished senators and the ambassador. We are not alone in this effort to support the grassroots response to the invasion. As many of you know, the World Central Food Kitchen, our partner in this event today, led by the chef, the world-renowned chef, Jose Andreas, and his CEO, Nate Mook, have really ar architected and pioneered a unique model for working with Ukrainian chefs with food workers locally to deliver meals. It is nothing short of remarkable. I think everyone every day should have an event with this organization, and we again are honored to have Nate and, and his, some of his team here remotely. I can see them, you guys will see them later, um, joining us for our panel. The McCain Institute and the World Central Food Kitchen, again, are very grateful to Senator Risch for hosting us, for letting us have this room. And I'm very excited because we have two senators here and more joining us. Again, it's a sign of United States bipartisan support for Ukraine. We all have a lot at stake here. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Senator Jim Risch. He is the ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, has served for a long time with distinction. Senator Risch, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much uh, for those kind words and welcome, everyone. I'm honored uh, to be able to host you here today. 
Uh, and uh, look, I, I have to say that uh, I follow what you do, both the uh, uh, McCain Institute and the World Central Kitchen, uh, and what they do in, in supplying meals and support for displaced Ukrainians. Uh, it, it is significant, it is admirable, and uh, certainly uh, you were to get uh, great credit for that. Uh, I walked in these rooms and these halls with John McCain for a lot of years, and uh, I can tell you, if he were here, he would be incredibly proud of you, and particularly that uh, what the McCain Institute is doing in his name, and uh, it, it, is, uh, it is greatly appreciated. Uh, all of you know the uh, catastrophe that's going on uh, in Ukraine. Uh, we, uh, we, the world, made a horrible mistake after, uh, after the Iron Curtain uh, came down and assumed that uh, Russia would uh, behave itself and join its, take, a, take a place on the world stage as, uh, uh, as a responsible party. Uh, that uh, went on for a long period of time, and even though they did some bad things, we were lulled into complacency and uh, not realizing uh, or, or thinking uh, the unthinkable, that somebody would start a medieval war uh, in the 21st century, and that's just what happened. Uh, Vladimir Putin is a war criminal. Uh, by uh, ordering troops into Ukraine, that was a war crime. It was an act of terrorism. It, uh, it was a cowardly act, marching on a, a country that, uh, that really, from an arms standpoint and numerically, is, uh, is much smaller. It was an act of a bully. He, Vladimir Putin, is responsible for every single act that occurred in that war as a war criminal. It was done at his behest, it was done at his direction. And when this is over, this is not over. Uh, we have got to see that there is accountability for this. We've seen this once other, once before in this decade, and it's still going on, and that is uh, Bashir Assad uh, did the same thing in Syria and is still sitting uh, on the throne, uh, and uh, uh, that, that's not a good thing. And interestingly enough, he was aided and abetted uh, by, uh, by Putin. Uh, so, uh, look, this is, a, uh, th this is a difficult situation, but uh, the, the, our, our friends uh, in Ukraine are going through what we Americans did in 1776. There are very, very direct parallels. I've told Madam Ambassador this, and. Uh, the, uh, uh, all the people I've met with from Ukraine, that this, uh, th this struggle that uh, is taking place right now will become a fabric of their history and a fabric of their culture as they go forward, just as the American Revolution and our struggle for uh, independence is part of America's fabric. And the result of that is, as difficult as it is right now, for centuries to come, for generations to come, because of what you've given for this, it'll never be taken away from you. The people will never forget it and they will never let it go. And so bless you for what you're doing. And uh, as you know, we're, uh, we're doing a lot of things. I'm, I'm uh, not fully satisfied with everything we're doing. Uh, we, uh, at, we as Americans uh, have said we're going to help and certainly we, we've done a lot, as you pointed out and others have pointed out. But if this is gonna get done, we need to do more. And uh, there's no reason we shouldn't do more. As uh, I look around the room, some of you are too young to remember, but uh, in, uh, in both Korea, when we fought there, uh, and in Vietnam, when we fought there, the Russians supplied fighter planes to the other side, and they trained the pilots to fly those planes. It's time that we return the favor. So uh, I, I think we need to step it up, and I, I urge uh, that we do so at every opportunity I get. Uh, I'm, I'm heartened to see that, uh, that you, the, the McCain Institute, and, uh, uh, and the World uh, Kitchen, uh, what you're doing, and the support uh, for the grassroots organizations uh, that are working there. Groups like uh, World Central Kitchen have risen to the challenge and provided hundreds of thousands of fresh meals and food kits to Ukrainian citizens, both inside and outside of their home and country each day. For that, we're uh, we and the Ukrainians are very grateful, and most of you know that in addition to the World Kitchen, on a much smaller scale, ordinary Americans have traveled over there to, uh, to engage in this. And so, uh, uh, as usual, America steps up as uh, the, the country that uh, consists of the most generous people on the planet. 
uh, in the east and south of the country, close to the fighting shortages of goods are particularly acute. Sadly, these shortages created by Russia's brutal and unjustified war extend far beyond Ukraine. Putin is quite literally using food as a weapon, blocking exports to countries in need, uh, in need in an effort to extort sanctions relief. This is another despicable act on his part, and it's done knowingly, willfully, intentionally, with a black and abandoned heart uh, against humanity. And uh, like I said, when this is over, it's not over until we see that justice is done. Uh, when the war ends, Ukraine will have a chance to rebuild anew. My colleagues in the Senate and I will continue to support uh, the government and people of Ukraine and the tireless work that all of you are doing to help Ukraine and the people that are there. Thank you so much. God bless you all for your work. Thank you for having me here today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much, Senator. Next up, we have Senator Ben Cardin from Maryland. He is one of the senior members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and the chairman of the U.S. Helsinki Commission. So he's also keenly focused on human rights. <laughs> thank you. Well, first, Evelyn Farkas, uh, thank you so much for what you do, your leadership at the McCain Institute, the importance of the McCain Institute in uh, protecting and defending democracy and human rights around the world. So thank you very much. And by the way, uh, you've been motivated by two of my former colleagues who I admire so greatly, Senator Levin and Senator McCain. So you, you come from good stock, as we say. And so thank you. I, I, I know that we're joined here by Senator Whitehouse and Senator Young, who are two of our great leaders uh, in regards to the U.S. support for Ukraine uh, and our fight globally for American democracy values and human rights. And uh, I, I also want to acknowledge uh, Ambassador Mara Kovarova for her tireless efforts on behalf of the people of Ukraine. I think you're here 24 hours a day on the Hill, and we thank you for keeping us engaged as to the needs of the people of Ukraine and working with us to effectively provide for those needs. Just one word about Senator McCain. Uh, I think of Senator McCain frequently. Uh, he was uh, my hero in regards to human rights. He was my partner in regards to the passage of the Magnitsky uh, sanction law. And uh, the two of us hold the distinction of being the very first two on the prohibitive list by the Russian Federation to visit Russia. So um, his efforts to help in regards to the passage of the Magnitsky sanctions is one of the key efforts, one of the key tools that we've been able to deploy to go after those who are helped finance the, the Russian atrocity machine. So uh, the, to the McCain Institute for carrying out his work by his name, uh, thank you very much. And uh, to uh, Mr. Moak, uh, in regards to the work done by the World Central Kitchen. All of us have been motivated by Chef Jose Andres. I've, I've met with him. He's a motivation to all of us. The work that you have done uh, in regards to dealing with food relief to those who have been displaced or disrupted as a result of the tragedies around the world. We know your work in Puerto Rico, but we know of your work in Ukraine. So to both of the institutions that are represented here today and to all the panelists, thank you for what you're doing. I just really want to underscore the point that Senator Risch made, and that is I am very proud of the U.S. leadership in mobilizing the global community to make it clear that we are with the Ukrainian people. They have such courage, uh, and they have certainly um, performed well beyond what was anticipated, but certainly by Mr. Mr. Putin. Uh, we are very much in it for the long run, and we know that. Uh, Senator Risch talked about our support for the Ukrainian military effort, and we will continue to provide the, the weapons that they need. I'm proud to have worked with Senator Cornyn in regards to the Lend-Lease legislation that was enacted. It's just part of our overall strategy of U.S. leadership through our actions and through our international diplomacy to provide the Ukrainians everything they need to defend their sovereignty. They are the front lines of democracy. And Senator Graham is also here, which is one of the, the great champions in regards to human rights. Senator Graham also was on that early list. 
uh, in regards to his uh, campaign to make sure that we uh, isolated the, 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 what Mr. Putin was trying to do. But we are uh, very much uh, in support of the Ukrainian people. But it goes beyond just the military that they need. We are very proud of the U.S. leadership in regards to sanctions to isolate the Russian regime and the, the oligarchs that are supporting that effort. Uh, I am, uh, as Evelyn pointed out, the chair of the U.S. Helsinki Commission. Uh, Russia has violated every single commitment they made under the, final, the Helsinki Final Act, every single one. We recently held hearings to deal with the issues in addition to the military needs, but to recognize the challenges we have on the humanitarian front. And that's where the World Central Kitchen has really stepped up in regards to the humanitarian needs of the displaced people, both within Ukraine and those that have sought refuge in other countries. We are committed to that humanitarian effort. But it goes beyond that. And one point I just want to underscore and stress, particularly as the chairman of the U.S. Helsinki Commission, and that is we will hold Mr. Putin and those responsible for these atrocities fully accountable for their war crimes and their crimes against humanity. That's an international responsibility. Yes, the Ukrainians will ultimately decide what is in their best national interest as they pursue the sovereignty of their country, but it's the international community's responsibility to hold accountable all those who have committed these atrocities. And lastly, I agree with Senator Risch. We will be part of the international effort, again, holding those accountable for these atrocities fully accountable to help Ukraine rebuild their country and rebuild uh, their, their great nation. And with that, I am just so proud to be part of our two institutions that are here today that have brought us together and the panelists that you have. And thank you for your continued effort. Remember, we're in there for the immediate needs, but we're also in there for the long run. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And now we are, we are introducing them in the order in which they arrived in true Senate fashion. And so I'm happy to introduce um, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, who um, many of you know was a close, dear friend of Senator McCain's, was the only Senate Senator pallbearer um, at his funeral. Um, he is a senator from Rhode Island, um, senior member of the Budget Committee. He is also on the Environment and Public Works um, Committee. And he's the subcommittee of the of the subcommittee, sorry, the chair of the subcommittee on water and wildlife. So he has a passion also for the environment domestically and internationally. So without further ado, Senator Whitehouse. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. I think this is the first time we've seen each other in person since you took this position. So good to see you in 3D and personal congratulations. Um, if there's one thing that's clear right now, it's that the frontier of freedom on the planet runs through the Donbass. And we need to make sure that we win the battle along that frontier. The political effort that Ukraine has shown is nothing short of stirring and majestic. The performance of its military is extraordinary. The partisan effort that has stood up in the regions that is below the level of the formal Ukrainian military has been impressive. And civil society has had a really important role through World Central Kitchen, but also through Razom for Ukraine and 100% Life and many other organizations that have kept things moving in a war environment. So thank you. Um, I've had the chance to hear a lot from Ukraine's parliamentarians, both here and in Davos, from uh, activists for Ukraine, from artists and writers from Ukraine, and the message is coming through loud and clear, which is that we will fight this thing through to the end. Give us the tools, and we will finish the job. Um, Senator Graham and I have been uh, active in two particular fronts that are highly relevant here. One is the question of battling kleptocracy and taking full advantage of pressuring the Russian oligarchs to, in turn,
put pressure on and debilitate uh, the Russian effort and Putin in particular. And the second is the prospect of Ukrainian victory. Nobody would say the word victory. Um, and Lindsay and I went to the floor and said, you know, this is like, this is a thing that can be won. This is our frontier of freedom, and we can have a victory on that frontier, and we should dedicate ourselves to making this happen. So it's been a real pleasure working with my friend Lindsay on these lines, and I will say that a lot of this got framed out in Codell McCain in the travel to and from Munich and during that conference. That is a very important congressional delegation trip where things like this happen, and it's the only congressional delegation trip that is not named for its lead sponsor. Lindsay and I have insisted that it remains and will remain Codell McCain for as long as we go to the Munich Security Conference. I'll close by saying that what is going on in Ukraine has opened up a window on the danger to the world of the dark economy that has coddled and supported the Russian oligarchs and allowed them to hide. And they are an evil force in the world, there is no doubt about it, but there are many other evil forces in the world that are also coddled and supported and hidden by the global dark economy that we allow. And the President's Democracy Initiative is beginning to target this, needs to target it. The klepto capture effort in the Department of Justice needs to continue to target this, needs to target it more uh, robustly. We are actually in a clash of civilizations. It's not quite what Mr. Huntington said. It's much more rule of law versus autocracy, corruption, and kleptocracy. But our rule of law world, giving aid, comfort, and shelter to the worst behaved people in autocracy, kleptocracy, and corruption world is unacceptable. It's strategically stupid, it is dangerous, and it is unacceptable. So we need to not only continue the pressure on the dark money, dark economy regime around the world, but it would be a great thing to have the McCain Institute continue to keep the pressure on on this, because for every corrupt, rotten Russian oligarch who has supported Putin in his massacres, there are equally desperate and grim people who are leaders of countries in Africa, who are running human trafficking organizations, who are narco-terrorists, and they're taking advantage of the very same structure that protected the Russian oligarchs. So we have a lot of good work ahead of us, and uh, Madam Ambassador, Slava Ukraina. Thank you so much, Senator. We, we will continue to put the pressure on. Today we're shining the light in a more positive direction. Um, I want to welcome now Senator Todd Young from Indiana. He is also a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Thank you so much, Senator, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great to visit with everyone today. I'm proud to stand here with my colleagues and, and uh, so many great leaders uh, and, and leaders to be as it relates to fighting for freedom and, and justice around the world. Um, listen, we have, we have countless brave men and women uh, that we're seeing on our TV screens. Many of you have had an opportunity to interact with them who are volunteers. Uh, they are activists uh, across the continent of Europe and beyond. And uh, their objective is, is to keep millions of uh, our, our fellow men and women from falling into absolute famine, uh, from, from succumbing to hunger. They are attempting to document crimes and abuses uh, throughout Ukraine. And uh, they are every day putting themselves into harm's way to stand up for a free and democratic Ukraine, Madam Ambassador. Even as Putin has made the starvation of Ukraine a priority. This is a, a national security priority of Vladimir Putin. He is trying to starve people. He's been targeting cropland uh, and targeting food storage facilities. Um, he has unleashed his, his war machine on the peoples and cities of Ukraine. We've, we've seen in the midst of all of this a groundswell of support for those with no greater hope 
than to see families not starve and for justice to prevail. We in Congress can shine, uh, I think, a better light on the challenge that these individuals face, and we can be a voice for those who have experienced food insecurity due to aggression, conflict, and violence. So I want to acknowledge an effort. Uh, I have been part of it, but I'm only one of many who have taken on uh, this effort to condemn the use of hunger as an instrument of war. Later this morning, I'm hopeful that the Senate Foreign Relations Committee will approve a resolution that uh, I'm leading with Senator Merkley of Oregon. This resolution condemns the cruel and shameless starving of innocent human beings through, uh, through warfare. I recognize that uh, this conflict uh, that we're here to address is, is uh, difficult to co contain, but the use of, of hunger, which hits families and children the har hardest as a deliberate instrument of, of conflict, should no know no place uh, in the modern world. The U.S. can and should be active opponents of this horrific practice, so I'm proud of this simple but necessary resolution that makes addressing and stopping this tactic a national priority. So I just thank you again for this platform. I thank you to World Central Kitchen and to the McCain Institute for your uh, continuing leadership in the midst of this conflict and really the world over. Um, you are showing great uh, leadership and uh, I look forward to more opportunities to do some good together. Thank you all. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator, for what you're doing. Um, it is really important that we all do what we can to ease the, the pressure um, of the famine worldwide. I now have the distinct pleasure of welcoming Senator Lindsey Graham, who is one of Senator McCain's oldest and dearest friends, his partner in calling out for more robust U.S. international engagement, calling out for human rights, and calling out on behalf of Ukraine. Um, I had the pleasure, of course, also of being on that McCain Codell with Senator Graham. He is senator from South Carolina, senior senator from South Carolina, as many of you know. He's the ranking member of the Budget Committee, and he's also a senior member of the Senate Appropriations Committee. Thank you so much for joining us today, Senator Graham. Good morning. Uh, I was thinking just a minute ago about if John were still with us. He wouldn't be here, he'd be in the Donbass. Yeah. The difference between me and him is he'd be in the Donbass, I'd be here talking about how to help Ukraine. Uh, but no, he would, uh, you know, he would be all in in defending our friends in Ukraine. So let me tell you about the way forward. I'm tired of reading stories about they need more weapons, it's taking too long. Give them the weapons. They're not asking for soldiers, right? They're taking the fight to the Russians in a way that nobody anticipated. So I'm hoping soon we'll have more stories about thank you for the new weapons that we needed last week, but we now have this week. Uh, on the front of holding Putin accountable, what would make Putin a loser? If when this is all over with, Ukraine is still standing as a sovereign democratic nation with security guarantees from the West? That'd be a big loss from Putin. If NATO were bigger, That'd be a big loss for Putin. If Europeans bought less oil and gas from Russia, that would be a big loss for Putin. If the International Criminal Court indicted him as a war criminal, that'd be a big loss for Putin. So my goal is for him to be a loser and for Ukraine to be the winner. Because if you don't stop him in Ukraine, he's going to keep going. On the food front, to our food guys, there were $5 billion in the last aid package to help people who depend on grain and corn coming out of Ukraine. Forty nations in the, in the world get 50% of their grain supply from the Ukraine. They're in a world of hurt. I think that in and of itself is a war crime. You're affecting nations outside the battle zone, and you're doing it deliberately. So from a Congress's point of view, we're going to have to appropriate more money, along with our European partners, to prop up African nations who are going to go into famine if we don't watch it. So the ripple effect of Ukraine is widespread. Uh, on the weapons front, more, better weapons. I talked to Dominic Robb uh, yesterday, the Deputy Prime Minister of uh, Great Britain. The British have been terrific. Boris Johnson's been terrific. 
We're going to meet, hopefully in July, to make sure that all of our nations in the West are sharing with the ICC evidence we have about war crimes. We have a law. We're not a part of the International Criminal Court, but I'm trying to change our law in a very narrow way to allow ICC investigators to come to the United States and gather evidence on foreign nationals regarding uh, Russian misadventures in Ukraine. So what I want the Russian commanders to understand, there's no forgive and forget, this is not the Crimea. You carry out these war crimes, we're coming after you. What I want the Ukrainian people to understand, we have your back as long as it takes. It took us years to earn our freedom over here. I hear about fatigue. How many of you have been to Ukraine to fight? What's the fatigue? You know, giving money to the Ukraine to allow them to stop Putin is the best money you could spend because with Putin, you pay now or you pay later. Defeating him is priceless because if he wins, he's still standing. There goes Taiwan. So the bottom line is that the McCain Institute, through you, the young people, are going to be a voice for generations for the cause of freedom. The McCain Institute is more important than ever to the people on the front lines of feeding the Ukrainians and providing food and comfort, God bless you, your heroes as much as anybody wearing the uniform, to the American people. It is in your interest that the Ukrainians win and Putin loses. God bless you all. Thank you so much, Senator. I don't think there's a single person in this room that disagreed with that comment. Um, we need to defeat Putin in the battlefield today so that he is no longer a threat to the international community. And with that, I now have the distinct pleasure of introducing Ambassador Oksana Makarova. Um, it's funny because the senators were commenting earlier that she's here so often, they don't know what else she does with her time. But for those of you who watch cable news, <laughs> and I admit I'm some of, somewhat of a junkie. She's on every cable news station as well, so I don't know, maybe she has some body doubles. Um, but Ambassador Makarova really should receive whatever distinguished medal there is for an ambassador out of all of the ambassadors that Ukraine has had, and also, and please don't tell your predecessors, <laughs> but also really in terms of your dedication, your, your energy, and your commitment to your country. You have been on the front lines because really the front lines are explaining to the American people, explaining to our policymakers what is at stake, explaining to everyone in this room what is at stake. So we are happy to have you here. Ambassador Makarova was finance minister of Ukraine, and then she became ambassador over a year ago, February of 2021. So she was almost thrown into the cauldron relatively quickly in her tenure. We are so lucky to have you here, Madam Ambassador. I know you have an event that you have to attend, um, and you are actually hosting at the embassy. So without further ado, please, I welcome you. Thank you very much, Evelyn. It's such a pleasure and honor to be here at this event organized by McCain Institute and also by the distinguished senators who have been here and you heard from all of them and Senator Rich, of course, for organizing it. Uh, first, uh, I, I think, you know, Senator McCain has been such a true friend, not only for Ukraine, but for Ukraine especially. He has been uh, there every time we needed him to be there. He has been on Maidan, he has been with us through many difficult times, and his advice and support here in, in Washington, D.C., but also everywhere, I mean, because he has been such a global uh, statesman, uh, was very well, uh, you know, very valued in Ukraine. And we still feel that through the work of the Institute, he's with us and he's helping us through all the excellent work that you are doing. So thank you, and please continue to do that. Um, 120 days. This is how long today we are fighting in this uh, new phase of the war. The war that started eight years ago when Russia attacked Ukraine and illegally seized Crimea and part of Donetsk and Lugansk. 120 days. Russians are firing pretty much everything they have at us, from south, from north, from Caspian Sea, from Belarus, uh, airstrikes, bombs, everything. And so many of our cities are destroyed, some of them like Mariupol, 95%. 120 days, there are thousands, tens of thousands of Russian soldiers on our sovereign land, and they're committing all kinds of atrocities and all kinds of war crimes. 
I cannot even imagine something they didn't do in Ukraine. And we see the evidence of that, especially in the areas that we liberated. They kill, they torture, they rape civilians, they target schools, museums, deliberately. So all the war crimes and everything that was said today here about justice is so true. But also it's 120 days of brave resistance. I mean, many people thought Ukraine would not survive even for, the, for, for three days for, of, of the beginning of this full-fledged aggression. But we not only survived, we are putting one hell of a fight. And we will do, continue to do that and we will not surrender. Now, what are the ingredients of that success? What is different now? Because it's not the first time Russia attacked the sovereign nation. I want to remind you about Georgia in 2008. I want to remind you about Ukraine in 2014 and 15. And we were forced into, into um, the peace agreement uh, that actually left parts of Donetsk and Lugansk and Crimea under Russian temporary control uh, in 2014. It's not the first time, again, because they attacked Syria. They shot down MH17 from the skies. They poisoned people on the streets of London. What is different this time? Um, and there are a couple of ingredients of this success that we have now, regardless of how hard the fight is. First is, uh, of course, our brave president, who not only stayed in Kyiv, but who's leading the country and who's ready to die with his country, and that's why we all are fighting. Second is our armed forces. The armed forces, the brave and very motivated armed forces that we have on the battlefield that have eight years of experience, and they will not surrender regardless of how hard the fight is. But I think uh, uh, third, of course, is our partners. And um, uh, I cannot say enough thank yous here in this capital for all the support that we get from President Biden, from the administration, from Congress on a very strong bipartisan basis. I am so happy and, and privileged that Ukraine has been an issue that united everyone here and the American people. So yes, of course we need more. Of course we need more weapons. We need more sanctions. We need more support for Ukraine. But a lot of help has been provided during this uh, uh, 120 days and before that, and Congress is the place, and Senate especially, where we are thanking for all that support. But the first very important element is very related to our friend Nate, who's here, is the civil society. Putin is not fighting, and Russian Federation is not fighting only with our president, armed forces, diplomats. He's actually fighting against all of us. All 40 millions of Ukrainians are defending our land. Where we can do it, with what we can do it with. And, and I think this has been also a game changer. That everyone who before was trying to improve our schools, trying to fight the corruption, trying to uh, help the uh, different, different uh, individuals and initiatives, just growing something in their backyards. Everyone now is a soldier of our country. And what we have also clearly seen, that the previous recipes do not work. Because again, the UN has been very good in condemning aggression. 141 countries said it's unacceptable. The court, the international court, as early as March 16, said that Putin has to stop and leave. And he still continues. So we have to find the new ways how to restore the international order. And we have to do things differently. And nobody is the better example of how to do things more efficiently and different than the World Central Kitchen. And I'm very proud to have my badge on me. Uh, Chef Hossein Dress and Nate, it took them only 24 hours to come to Ukraine. Not to the border of Ukraine, to Ukraine. 24 hours after the majority of cities were under, under bombs and, 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 uh, and we did not know whether Kyiv would not fall in three days, as it was said on TV. After that, they have been tireless in spreading their activities everywhere in Ukraine, going as far as to Mariupol and, and Kharkiv. They were not scared even when their own facilities have been hit. They have recruited thousands thousands of Ukrainians, and it's, it's, it's a 100% it's, it's a Ukrainian operations, and we can see the Nate Ukrainian too. Uh, and thank you very much for that message from Wurzel. It has been such an inspiration for me from my home uh, village just north of Bucha, uh, from which Nate sent me a video when they started uh, uh, there. But, you know, 
it shows you how the needs have to be addressed quickly, and they have to be addressed on the ground, and they have to be addressed, it has to be Ukraine-driven, it has to be uh, organized together with Ukrainians. So uh, I think this is a blueprint, if I may say so, for how we should do everything else, or of how we have to join forces, of how we have to show, because ultimately this is what it is about, that democracy delivers. That the reason why Putin attacked us, because we have made civilizational choice to be democratic, to be European, to be who we are and live peacefully in our own country. And we know that this is the best way, not only for Ukraine, but for all of us who believe in these principles and values. And this is how democracy delivers, when everyone participates, when everyone has the right to say what they want to say, but also when they have the right to do, when you join forces and just get things done. So thank you very much for World Central Kitchen for doing that. I think it's very much in spirit of what Senator McCain and how Senator McCain saw it. It's very much in spirit of how Senate and Congress in general is helping us now. There is a need and we need to fill that need and we have to join resources and we have to debureaucratize and uh, the processes in order to get this done because I just want to finish with why we are doing it. Because we need to win. Ukraine needs to win because it's existential for us, but I think all democratic world needs Ukraine to win and Russia to be defeated, the Putin's Russia to be defeated, because if they are not defeated and we do not win, then all of us who believe in democratic values are under threat and our world is not going to be a safe place to live. So with that, I just want to say God bless America, Slava Ukraini, and thank you for all the help, and thank you for this wonderful event that you're doing here. Thank you so much, Madam Ambassador. Slava um, Ukraini. I'm going to now transition to joining the panel. Um, we are very fortunate today, as I said before, to have Nate Mook here joining us. But we also have several other members. We have, um, actually, I'm going to introduce her with Nate. In the field, we have, you can see on the screen, hopefully, um, his colleague, Kate um, Serdyuk. Um, she has been traveling around Ukraine recently, so she'll give us a, a little bit of a peek into what's happening on the ground right now. Um, and we also have Katerina Smagli, who is with the Ukrainian Embassy. She's a member of the staff there, but we're very proud to say that she was a member of our Global Leadership Program, an alumni of it. And we have a current member, um, Maria Levchenko, um, on the screen with us as well. And I mentioned Maria earlier. Um, so really, the only thing I want to add is maybe to say a few words um, paraphrasing Chef, Chef Jose Andreas, because he has had the opportunity of testifying here before in, in, I believe, the House, but probably also the Senate. And he made the point that the international community really has, the international organizations have not, they have not, as you heard from the, the ambassador, they have not been quick. They have not been exhaustive. They have not filled a huge gap. And so it was up to this very resourceful, innovative organization the World Central Kitchen, to come to Ukraine and work with Ukrainians on the ground. And as, as I said, this is a model that was pioneered initially in Haiti. And we are so fortunate to have Nate Mook here today because he is somebody who has really worked to, to bring the grassroots to the nation's capital and elsewhere, to empower local people to make truly global change. So without further ado, I want to turn it over to Nate to speak a little bit about the work of his organization. Thank you. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Evelyn. Uh, Senators, Ambassador, uh, it's really an honor to, to be with all of you today. I will be quick so we can uh, uh, dig into the panel, and, and also I want to, to turn it over as well to, to Kate on my team, who is in Ukraine right now. Um, I've spent much of the last four months in Ukraine. Uh, as the ambassador said, I remember just a couple days into the conflict, uh, I Zoomed with her from Lviv, um, and uh, as we didn't know if, if Ukraine was going to fall, and, and I had a map behind me, and, and Kate from our team was in the office as well, and uh, 
and I pointed to the map and I said, you know, we're, we're going to be everywhere we need to be. And we started small. We, we arrived, our team arrived on the border with Poland just hours after the invasion began. We didn't know what to expect. We honestly thought that there'd be a big presence of the international community. We'd have UNHCR there. You'd have the World Food Program there. You'd have the Red Cross there. But what we found was nobody was there except volunteer groups, Polish, Ukrainian groups coming together to support these refugees as they were streaming across the border in the tens of thousands. So we started moving quickly. We activated our teams there along the border, quickly expanding into every single border crossing out of Ukraine to support families as they were leaving, now operating in eight countries uh, that are receiving refugees, and immediately began seeing how we could work in Ukraine, getting connected to chefs, restaurants on the ground in Ukraine immediately, within 24 hours, um, and we said, what can we do to help you feed your people? And what was amazing is it was, many of them were already doing this. Within hours after the invasion began, as the ambassador was saying, the Ukrainian people stepped up and joined the fight in their own way. So truly, truly incredible to see that response. With the incredible help of our Ukrainian team, we soon grew reaching hundreds of cities and towns across the country. We now have a team of about 4,500 Ukrainians that are working with us from our cooks in the kitchen to our warehouse workers, to our delivery drivers, to our amazing team leaders like Kate, who you hear from in a second. That's how we've been able to do what we're doing. And with their help, we are now distributing between our fresh meals that we're cooking and our kits of foods. So these are 30 pound bags that have everything a family needs for a week. We're now distributing close to 1 million meals per day across Ukraine. And I think that is just a testament to this grassroots force that has come together. And I'm so proud because it's not just about the scale of what we're doing, which of course is important to reach as many places as possible right now, to reach as many families as possible because you have families that have had to flee Ukraine, you have internally displaced families, um, but you also have families that are stuck where they are on the active fronts of fighting or families that are living in liberated areas that, where infrastructure has been completely destroyed. And that speed of getting to the places where people need food is also equally as important. Um, Jose actually, by a fluke connection with the mayor of Irpin, ended up arriving in Bucha just hours after it was liberated. There was still fighting going on at the end. And Jose ended up being the first person many people had seen in a month as they were emerging from their basements as the town was liberated by Ukrainian forces. And immediately, we handed them a warm plate of food. And we didn't stop. We go back every single day. Uh, I found myself a couple of months ago in this town of Trusnayets, and this was uh, not too far from the Russian border in the Sumy region. And this town had turned into a thoroughfare for Russian troops and arms coming into the country. And the town had been completely obliterated. Working with the railway, we were able to get there on the ground. I've never seen such destruction in my life. And our team, just a few days later, because there was no infrastructure left, built an outdoor cafe for thousands of residents that were there, which is just truly, truly incredible. Even today, as I woke up this morning and checked in with our team, we were delivering shelf-stable meals into the town of Lushashansk, and this is right near Severodonetsk, where the active fighting is going on, and unfortunately, the Russians are probably gonna take that town in the next day or two, so we're trying to get as much food into there as possible, and we've got these incredible volunteer teams of drivers and people going in. I've never seen such bravery in my life. And, uh, you know, this really has all been and continues to be supported solely by private donations, right? And this, the big agencies we know have been slow to respond. And unfortunately, the models that they operate on are just not designed for a crisis like this. It's not about the people, the individuals, it's about the systems. And that's why it's so important to have what we call our food fighters, which is this grassroots force um, supported by the international community. And I'll be honest with you, I'm worried about what 
I'm seeing. I just got back about 10 days, less than 10 days ago from Eastern Ukraine. I spent much of the last four months in Eastern Ukraine in the Donbas. And our team in Krematorsk, we've been hearing from them every day. It's getting worse. Um, one of our train cars was recently hit by a missile. Thankfully, nobody was injured. As I was driving into Krematorsk on my last trip there, we were still 40, 50 kilometers from the front lines. And in front of us was uh, Ukrainian troop transport because they're moving a lot of troops and probably US arms to the front lines. And right in front of us, less than 100 meters away, a Russian drone hit the Ukrainian transport in front of us and the vehicle exploded. Thankfully, it was armored, nobody was injured, the soldiers jumped out, but it was a reminder that even 50 kilometers from the front lines, the Russians are attacking. So again, it really just emphasized the urgency of now, that we have to move faster, we cannot wait. So here's my final message before I hand this over to the panel. Supporting Ukraine is not just with the missiles and the bullets. It's also with food. We need to ease the burden of the Ukrainian government. We need to stabilize the liberated cities and towns. And we have to meet the humanitarian needs of these communities. Russia right now is trying to expand its influence through hard power. We, the United States, we expand our influence through soft power. And humanitarian aid is America's most effective form of soft power but it's hard work and requires a lot of commitment. Winning the hearts and minds comes from caring for people in their darkest hour, rebuilding their economy when everything is broken, and providing a plate of food that nourishes not just the body, but also the soul. And I'm so grateful to have this incredible Ukrainian team behind our work at World Central Kitchen that makes it all possible. I know Jose is a big face. You see him all over the place. He was here in Congress just a week ago. But really, the people that are making it happen are folks like Kate who are on the ground and so many other Ukrainians who, who we'll hear from. So thank you so much, Evelyn, for having me here today. It's, so, it's an honor to be part of this conversation. Well, thank you, Nate. I really do feel, you know, listening to you, struck by the fact that we don't have words to thank you enough. We don't. Um, humanity doesn't have words to thank you and Jose Andreas enough. So really, thank you. Um, <laughs> those are the only words I have right now to say. Um, you know, the McCain Institute, we, the pillars of our work of, revolve around, or the three pillars essentially are defending and advancing democracy, human rights, and leadership, what we call character-driven leadership in the spirit of Senator McCain. And one of the ways that we advance our work is through individuals. So working with organizations such as yours, but also through individuals. And so what I want to do now with the panel is before we hear from Kate, um, and Kate be ready because we want the latest update, um, I'd like to turn it over to Maria. Um, Dr. Maria Levchenko, she's one of these young leaders that we support through our Global Leaders Program. And I would be remiss if I didn't point my hand over at, Doc, at, at Scott Nemeth, who runs the program for us. He's the director. Um, we select out of hundreds of applications every year, um, I believe it was 500 or more um, for this class, um, Unfortunately, only about 25, <laughs> and this year we added a 26th, the uh, second Ukrainian, um, mainly for budgetary reasons, um, so I can put in a plug also for support the McCain Institute Fellowship Program. Um, but these are leaders like um, Maria, who in her work prior to the invasion was a dialogue facilitation officer with the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Um, where she led efforts in civil society to encourage dialogue and peace building amongst young people, refugees, and women. So this was already before this year. Um, following the invasion, um, unsurprisingly, she was forced to flee Ukraine. She's currently in Germany. And Maria, I would like to ask you, you have worked on civil society in Ukraine. What is it that, what are the factors that have resulted in such a robust civil society? I think many of us who have worked on Eastern Europe um, see across Eastern Europe a spotty uh, record with regard to how active the, the civil society is, how strong it is. And most people would not have predicted that Ukraine has such a robust civil society. Can you explain that to us? Thank you so much for the question. Uh, dear senators, your excellency, panelists, first of all, I wanted to say that it's an honor and pleasure to be representing Ukrainian voice today here. 
And it seems that everyone knows that around 5 a.m. on February 24, Russian army began shelling the territory of Ukraine and explosions were heard in many cities. But in fact, the war did not begin then. The real beginning of the war was in 2014. And this war has been going on for eight years. In 2014, our country was not ready for it. And that was the first time when civil society and grassroots organizations did almost everything from evacuation of the civilians from the war zone to the purchase of the uniforms for the army, from providing legal advice to helping IDPs. I was also the one who established my own NGO working with IDPs on the ground because we saw no other way. That was the cause that called for all of us. And during these eight years, civil society in Ukraine has been working and developing itself nonstop. From Mariupol to Lviv, from Ushgorod to Kharkiv, every city had a network of active individuals, grassroots organizations working for the society and for the local communities. That's why in the first days and even hours of the full-scale Russian-Ukrainian war, various civil society institutions switched their activities from dialogue to humanitarian assistance, fighting propaganda, and they started to build and to restore effective forms of interaction between different stakeholders. Because the history of uniting social efforts during the Revolution of Dignity, the occupation of Crimea, the armed conflicts in Donetsk and Lugansk regions have been repeated. And now, of course, one of the main reasons that played out in this very strong response is that we are protecting our land, we are fighting for our children, and we are fighting for our future. Because right now there is no other way than to take this common cause into our own hands. So that's why the response from the grassroots initiatives is so strong. We have to unite and we are doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you for everything you are doing. So next, I would like to give Kate a chance to update us. So Kate Serdyuk is the head of World Central Kitchen's operations. She's located in Kyiv. Um, and as I have heard, she, you have been traveling extensively throughout the country and are up to date on the situation there. If you could bring us up to date and, of course, mention any concerns and things that we, we need to know as Americans here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi to all. Uh, I'm so glad uh, to be participate to participate in such unique event and to be a voice of grassroots defense of uh, democracy and human rights here. Because um, the most important thing that we're doing right now is not only fighting with weapon, not only fighting with food, but also fighting with uh, our uh, humanity and. Um, yeah, I'm located in uh, Kiev, but actually uh, my home now is uh, hotels in different cities of Ukraine because we need to be in ground in every every city because situation in every point is uh, totally different and unique like from a different planets because uh, if we are in Kharkiv, we need to be focused on hot meals because a lot of uh, houses, uh, apartment houses is destroyed and uh, people have no electricity, no opportunity to cook. And that is why we need to be focused on this. But if we compare the situation in north of Ukraine right now, uh, people uh, started cooking by themselves and we need to bring grocery bags. So this is why uh, we have a lot of local people. And I guess that unique side of World Central Kitchen is that we have a lot of local coordinator and they help us with a very, very accurate data, how many people we have, how many foods or hot meals or sandwiches or retorted bags we need to bring. So there is no um, the same situation. And uh, when uh, we were in Kiev and uh, Bucha and Arpin was liberated, we were the first in first April who comes uh, who came in uh, Irpin and we just brought uh, six uh, thousand of uh, food without any packs because uh, we understand that we need to be fast because people uh, suffered from for, for for two months and we need to help them as soon as we can. So our first step was just to bring food as much as we can. But after that, we realized we learn day by day that we can do it better. And we started to pack uh, grocery bags. So it is a great example how such uh, organization like World Central Kitchen work here. But I guess that uh, WCK is really unique. And I'm saying this not only because I'm participating on this organization, but also it's really uh, like this. And um, right now we focus
about refugees uh, who's uh, going to Lviv, for example. I'm just coming back uh, from Lviv and I saw the situation that there are a lot, a lot of uh, model cities where people live uh, in uh, like weak boxes. And of course, we understand that there's accommodacy is not good for them, but still they have something and have meals and this is why it is not only about food but it is also about hope about confidence and about uh, things that somebody support them and somebody care about them a lot so they're not alone and uh, for people it is very important to know that the whole community of the world support them and they know that Ukraine win and uh, we can bring this confidence through food and for us it's a big uh, big deal that we can uh, support people by means of food and we do it every day so 260 hot meals 260,000 of hot meals we prepare every day and uh, also 40,000 of uh, grocery bags people receive every day. And uh, of course, it's we cannot cover all of Ukraine, but we do as much as we can. And uh, I think that uh, our team uh, make a great difference and a huge relief for Ukrainians. And everything what's happened, it's happened by means of your support as well. And I really appreciate being here right now and um, like in my way from Lviv to Kiev right now, I'm Rivne, and I know that this city also have our partners restaurant, and I'm proud that we and you can go to every every city in Ukraine and found uh, this logo, Old Central Kitchen, in every restaurant in, in every city. It means that uh, support of America, support of all of world is here right now and you can be confident that we will keep ukrainians in our warm hands and give them as much as we can thank you so much thank you very much kate thank you for everything you're doing you are keeping ukrainians alive but you are also keeping hope alive for ukrainians and really for people around the world so stay safe and keep doing your good work um, before I go to the last member of our panel, um, I'm going to uh, introduce um, our very distinguished senator from Arizona, and, um, and he is a great friend of the Institute, a great friend of the McCain family, and so without further ado, Senator Kelly, please, I welcome you to the podium. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, and good morning. I uh, hope you've had a great conference. Uh, really been quite the uh, honor of my lifetime to have the opportunity to serve in what I consider John McCain's uh, Senate seat. Um, I want to say also a special thank you uh, to those joining us from the uh, Embassy of Ukraine uh, and all the bright leaders here from the McCain Institute. And of course, also from the World Central Kitchen, um, started by my good friend, uh, Jose Andres. Um, so in February, in February, a uh, threat we've watched for years became a reality uh, when Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine, putting in danger millions of Ukrainians, Ukrainians who just want to live freely and peacefully in a democracy. And let me just uh, say, and I, I realize everybody knows this, but there was no greater supporter of Ukrainian independence than Senator John McCain. So it's quite fitting that the McCain Institute has gathered and rallied grassroots leaders from around the region uh, to shed light on the heroic and life-saving efforts supporting Ukraine and its neighbors. In these last few months, we have seen the proof that America is at its best when we pull the world together behind shared values and join together against evil. In April, I returned from a trip with some of my colleagues, uh, including Senator Whitehouse, who I believe you heard from earlier. Uh, we returned on this trip to Europe and Asia, where we met with NATO allies, with leaders in the Gulf, uh, in India, uh, American service members stationed abroad, including the 82nd Airborne Division, of which uh, where, I don't know, over 50 years ago now, my father served. Uh, but also, we met with Ukrainian leaders who continue 
to provide my office uh, updates from the front lines. I had the opportunity a couple days ago, I guess on Tuesday, to meet with some Ukrainian pilots, some MiG-29 pilots, and uh, Ukrainian civil society uh, in folks that uh, gave me an update about what their fighter pilots are dealing with uh, over the skies of Ukraine. You know, just uh, as a former uh, Navy combat pilot myself, it was uh, helpful to get, you know, firsthand information uh, from these guys who are flying missions uh, against uh, Russian airplanes uh, on uh, a nearly daily basis and the challenges that they face and what we can do to be more helpful. So the world has seen the strength of American leadership and of the NATO alliance, and we're seeing our partners step up in ways that I would say was, was basically out of reach a year ago, uh, or even later last year. Uh, yeah, and I've been really proud to have the opportunity to join my Senate colleagues to mobilize the resources here in Washington. I've worked hard to get security assistance to Ukraine in the form of the correct advanced weapon systems uh, and advanced weapons, uh, the medicines that they need, and other humanitarian aid, as well as uh, continue to help advance democratic values. And these actions were met with an equal reaction from folks uh, on the ground, with help from people across the globe. And that made our collective impact in support for our friends in Ukraine so much stronger. World Central Kitchen, as an example, took to the borders and began serving meals within hours of the invasion and has since expanded this effort to even more countries in Eastern Europe so that a hot meal is never far out of reach for those individuals that have been so greatly impacted by this war. Thousands of global nonprofits started and grew aid supply chains, delivering much needed resources to organizations who could then turn that around to perform the most good. And ambassador to the UN agencies for food and agriculture, a very familiar face to all of you, Cindy McCain has been marshalling the resources and capital needed to respond to this crisis and save lives, whether it's organizing and distributing supplies, welcoming refugees at border centers, or continuing to sound the alarm. Um, you know, necessary work to bolster international food security. And as an Arizonan, um, you know, I can't speak for all Arizonans, but we should be really proud of the work that Cindy McCain is doing. It is saving people's lives. You know, and as this conflict continues, you know, I know one thing. If we work together from the place of our shared values, uh, democracy and peace will prevail. But we have our work cut out for us. Um, but of, as Americans, you know, we are not afraid of hard work. Uh, we've always seized the opportunity to lead even during the most challenging times. And the folks here and the work they do exemplifies that. So let us stay vigilant, let us stay determined, and most of all, stay united as we tackle one of the most difficult times in global security uh, that I think, at least in my lifetime, that we've seen. And we also need to make sure, and let me make this point very clear, we need to make sure that Russia does not win this war. Thank you uh, for everything you've all done and continue to do, and uh, I'm here to support you. Thank you. Thank you again, Senator. Russia will not win. So last but certainly not least, we are so honored to have Katya, uh, and I want to make sure I pronounce your name, your last name right, Smogli with us today. Um, Katya is really the exemplar of what we are doing with the McCain Global Leaders Program because she is an alumni of the program, already distinguished herself as a young leader in Ukraine, and she is now a member of the embassy team. She works at the Ukrainian embassy and has worked tirelessly along with her ambassador to rally really Ukrainian American diaspora, American civil society to support Ukraine. So it's not just Ukrainian civil society and of course strong NGOs like World Central Kitchen, but it's also 
the, the active engagement of Americans. And so, Katya, if you could talk a little bit about your efforts, what you have learned, um, if you have any other call for action, we will welcome it. Thank you very much, Evelyn, and thank you, everyone, for being with us today. Um, it is my great pleasure to join this panel. I am a proud uh, member of the McCain family. It is my badge of honor, um, and I can say that it truly prepared me to everything I do now here at the Embassy of Ukraine. My diplomatic career is not too long. I started only two years ago at the Foreign Ministry of Ukraine, and it's interesting that I've been a civil society activist and educator for most of my life. So when I came here, I was truly amazed that you know this uh, idea of Ukrainian uh, civil society supporting this war effort equally applies to what I can now see in Ukraine. You probably know that there are two million people of Ukrainian origin in Ukraine. Our diaspora is huge. There were several waves of uh, immigration and some Ukrainian-American organization now will celebrate their centennial. They've been established a long, long uh, time ago, but there are also new organizations which are made up of a young generation of Ukrainians, um, people who work in IT, young professionals, who came to work in places like New York, San Francisco, and who established very successful organizations. One name uh, you may probably heard, it's Razum, or United in Ukrainian. They uh, managed to fundraise more than 30 million US dollars, and they provide tremendous uh, support, medical supplies, um, food, some uh, even military assistance to territorial defense units. They also have people on the ground. Uh, for those of you who are interested uh, to learn more about what civil society in Ukraine is doing, I highly recommend uh, going to the website of the National Endowment for Democracy, which only one week ago bestowed its annual uh, Democracy Awards, and this year they've been given to four female civil society activists uh, from Ukraine. It was a fascinating discussion because all of them work in uh, different areas. But only one element of this discussion I would like to raise here, because um, there was an episode which a woman who managed within a couple of days to set up an online network uh, to which almost 100,000 Ukrainian volunteers signed up to coordinate their efforts at the national uh, level. And she brought an example of a person in uh, Kiev uh, Oblast before this particular village was occupied by Russian forces needing urgently some medication against cancer. And within hours, she managed to find a volunteer who in his car uh, decided to jump in, uh, probably drive for a couple of hours to uh, deliver those vitally important medication to the person who needed it. And already on his way back, he realized that the village where the person stayed was already occupied by the Russian forces. And when she was telling this story, she concluded by saying that what I realized is that to be a good leader, to be a great activist, you don't necessarily need a degree from Stanford or, or Harvard. You just need to be ready to jump in and actually do things. I know it's very difficult to uh, close this session on a strong and, with a strong and powerful message, but when I was thinking about it and some associations that I had in my uh, head was that the McCain Institute, when it talks about itself, it always proudly says that it is an institution that stays in the arena. And I believe that those words of President Theodore Roosevelt, his famous speech, uh, to be in the arena, they are so important today. They resonate so strongly to everything that happens today and th what these challenges of the day uh, require from us. Let me remind you what President Theodore Roosevelt said um, when he spoke to his audience in Paris and called people to join this uh, effort. It is not the critic who counts. It is not the man who points at how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who spends himself in a worthy cause, and if he fails, 
he fails while daring greatly, so that his place will never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. I believe that our strong women who've been with us today and Nate, who is here today, are the best exemplars of those people who are in the arena. And to close up, I will just encourage all of you to be leaders in heart and to follow everything that McCain Institute does because it is an institution which stays in the arena and who is doing tremendous work to make our world better. Thank you, Evelyn. <laughs> Well, Katya, I'm almost afraid to speak because really you should have the last word. Thank you so much for those really um, on-point words for your rallying cry. I think everyone in the room here understands Ukraine, Ukraine needs help and each and every one of us can do something. And you are absolutely right. Um, you, you, you really took on the McCain ethos because Senator McCain was adamant that the McCain Institute not become a kind of think tank where we issue papers. The whole idea is to enable people like yourselves to lift you up, to shine the light, so that more people do more things like you're doing today. So I really want to thank Nate for everything you are doing, including being an advisor to the McCain Global Leaders Program. We have a very distinguished um, panel of advisors, um, including Nate, David Axelrod, I can't even name all the names. Um, you can go and find it on the website. But you bring such great expertise and talent and wisdom to that group. Um, thank you for everything you're doing across the world. Please thank Jose Andreas as well on behalf of all of us. Katya, thank you for what you are doing together with American citizens and all around the world to help Ukraine. And Kate, please, as I said before, stay safe. Thank you for what you are doing. And Maria as well. Both of you are really in, in, the, the, in the arena in a more immediate fashion right now than we are. Um, so really, thank you all. Um, for coming today. We appreciate your time, taking the, the, the time to spend a, applauding what these people are doing and really um, your own talents hopefully will be brought to bear as well. So thank you.